as I mentioned last week, um, the uh, Hasidic practice of meditating on holy words, I think, is a wonderful guide to the study of the Siddur and the study of the prayer book, and that is you focus on a word or a phrase, and you hold it in the, uh, in the eye of the mind, and you repeat it. Maybe you study it, maybe you think about it, but ultimately it has a kind of a gravitational weight, and it settles further and further and further into the inner life until one experience that I had was it seems to break through the granite that separates consciousness from the rivers of Eden within us, and suddenly a channel begins to flow up. And last week I wanted to talk about kindness. It comes from, first of all, this Hasidic meditation, and a um, uh, something of a technique in Hasidic counseling. Uh, when I notice people aren't being kind to each other, I don't want to repeat the entire Devar Torah from last week, and people say, yeah, you're right, we should be kind, and and I just stay right there. I say, but but really kind. And people say, yeah, I, I get it. And part of me feels, from what I've just seen, I'm not seeing real kindness. And I just try to stay right there and lead people into that moment when the word kindness, chesed, breaks through uh, into the waters of Eden and causes us to look back at our lives with some degree of pain and sorrow and remorse, that once we discover the law of kindness, we realize that we haven't lived up to it. We know the law. It's ruminating inside of us. Uh, it's there in potential. But we haven't allowed it to govern our lives. Something in us resists terribly. For example, the law of kindness, even the law of civility. And without that regret and that sorrow and remorse, I don't think we can actually learn the law because you can't learn the law deeply unless you experience how, fall you've, how far you've fallen short. So there's a deep connection between regret, remorse, and sorrow, and knowledge. How can you know a spiritual value, truly know it, if upon knowing it, you don't feel great sorrow. Great sorrow for how you lived, regret, and sorrow for humanity. And then we look at other people, for example, who have not treated us with chesed, who maybe didn't care, or thought they were and they weren't. And you feel sorrow for yourself, and you feel sorrow for them, that they have been so out of touch like you with the law of kindness. And just meditating on one word can take us into such deep places if we follow this I call it a Hasidic practice because I, I somewhat learned it on my own and then I discovered it was an enshrined practice in, the, in, in Hasidism, which is the gravitational power of holy words. Uh, so I want to say um, uh, uh, how we connect law and ethics. So in liberal Judaism, of course, there's a lot of focus on morality and ethics and less on the law. I think with a good insight that at some level, uh, every law that is not simply about preserving a social order uh, based on the pecking order that Rabbi Manning spoke about. We're going to put that aside. Because at some level, law should not make distinctions between people, but only, as Martin Luther King said, content of character and treating people fairly, treating people, at least in the eyes of the law, equally. And therefore, ethics causes us to treat people with decency and kindness, and at some level, law ideally tries to preserve that. Which means if we're all equal in the eyes of the law and equal in the eyes of God, then every law should try to erase any distinctions between us that are not essential to our humanity as human beings. Now, this takes me back to uh, something I talked about on Wednesday night, is the distinction between what I'm going to call the religious orientation in Law and Aristotle, who I've been revisiting since I uh, spoke about Aristotle and Maimonides a little bit too quickly before the uh, high holidays, and that is this. Uh, when Aristotle tries to think about uh, ethics, Aristotle focuses on character, and he asks for us to have a vision of ourselves, a rational vision of ourselves of a good, flourishing life. What exactly would that be like? 
And I use the image of a magic wand. If you had a magic wand that could change a relationship, change the way that you and others spoke with each other, uh, change the way that we emoted with each other, and you had a magic wand that you could wave and would transform people. But the magic wand requires that you be very, very specific because you get one wish and you better say it exactly right. So you want to know how you, your spouse, your parent, your child, other people, exactly how we should talk, exactly how we should emote, what kind of words we, sh we could say that would lead to intimacy and growth and transformation. And then I introduced a, uh, a, a, uh, a, uh, a condition of the magic wand is you can only use it upon yourself. If you had a magic wand that would require you to live by the laws of ethics and civility, with no exceptions, it doesn't matter how you feel, it doesn't matter how distraught, it doesn't matter how overwrought you are, there's a magic wand that says you're going to live within the laws of kindness and civility. Would you wave the wand over yourself? Now, some people don't want to. They say, well, they have to go first. I've heard many people say, well, I'm willing to do it if the other person goes first. I say, that's not how this magic wand works. If you're not willing to wave it over yourself, then you don't get to wave it over anybody. And people say, okay. Next thing I say about this magic wand is it works incrementally. You can only uh, wave the wand over the different aspects of your being. First of all, to have a good vision. This is very Aristotelian, by the way. And then the will that Aristotle does not talk about very much, but you see this in the uh, Kabbalistic idea of the will as one of the faces of the infinite of the divine. And the idea of mitzvah. Uh, that is not because it's rational. It's not because you figured out the end of life, but you actually have a law you have to live by. Do you will yourself to follow the law, even if you haven't appropriated the law, even if you don't fully really understand the law? And you start with the vision the will, but the will to live by the law, not the will to figure out life, but the will to start out by living by the laws of life. And by living by the laws of life, you can actually eventually uh, figure out life. Last thing I said is, um, the magic wand is in your hand. So just look at your hand, and you look at your hand and you realize, my hand is the magic wand. I don't need a magic wand. Um, I can shape myself. So your consciousness is the magic wand. How willing are you to use the magic wand of consciousness and use your consciousness to wave it over your inner life and with the magic of the vision and the will and the skill, transform yourself and transform yourself so much that you, as it were, isolated yourself as a person of great moral character, and other people are witnesses. You don't have to change them. Let them worry about themselves. Make sure that we are available for intimacy, and the, we are an agent of the good, and that we are patient and kind. And commit this self so deeply that you have to, as it were, you know, take the magic wand of your vision, will, and skill and wave it over your life every single day so you become that person don't worry about other people. Let people catch up and just make sure that if there's any tumult, anything's going on, that you're going to hold down the uh, the moral center. Uh, so this took me to a couple of strange places since uh, last week as I looked at this Torah portion. Uh, what Rabbi Manning said about the uh, first lines of our Torah portion, I completely agree with. I've taught it many times, even before Oratar. I remember teaching this when I was uh, up at Stephen White's Temple about the, the Evid Ivri, um, you know, how dare the Israelite hold, a, really not a slave, but a servant, and how dare the servant want to stay with the, uh, in, with the Baal, with the master. This was, like, this was a, 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 a terrible thing that the Evid should not say, I love my master, I want to stay, and the master takes the Evid uh, by the earlobe and takes them to the delet and, and runs it all through their earlobe, when the, and what does the, the mezuzah say? Love God, not your master. Boy, I had a great Devar Torah. And so what happens, I think, as, um, as I look at my life of teaching, something is shifting where I don't want to believe myself anymore. Anything I've been teaching for 40 years, I probably should not stop believing. That's a little rule of thumb. Um, and I thought to myself, 
how, how do I know what that evidence is feeling, what that servant is feeling? Maybe the servant is terrified of life. Maybe they're a broken, traumatized human being, and they actually do say to themselves, thank my lucky stars that I found you know, a master, as it will, who's a decent, beautiful human being and a family whom I love. And I want, I want to live here and I want to die here. They treat me well. And the person says, yeah, I love God, but I love where I am. I love you and I, and I love your family. And I don't want to stay here. And I don't, need, I don't need manumission. I just need you. As I went down that train of thought, I remember when I arrived at USC, and I jumped into the, into the world of what I'm going to call, uh, you know, uh, a little bit unkindly, the world of Jewish elites. Uh, and um, motherhood and raising children was looked down upon. That if a woman doesn't desire to be an emancipated professional, somehow their woman is denying their, uh, their fulfillment as a human being. I just remember where I grew up, you know, think of Linwood, Bellflower, Paramount, like, a lot of the, the people I knew said, my, my desire is to find a really good man who's going to love me and support me and raise a family. Yeah, I'll have a job. I hope I'm treated fairly. But my, my dream in life is not to jettison marriage and family. I really want marriage and family. And I remember when I would meet Jewish elites and I thought to myself privately, I'm saying it for the first time aloud, how dare you be so judgmental of people who want something so simple as a great husband and a great family? And, and, and fulfill the calling of motherhood. It might not be for you, but how dare you judge everybody else? And I kept it to myself, mostly. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, as, as I'm reading this portion, I find myself so judgmental of the evidence re who says, it's not that I don't love God, but I love you people as well. You're so good to me. I don't want to go. Now, I don't know if I would ever do that, but I might, depending how bad my life was and how bad my life has been. By the way, you did not become an Evid uh, because someone captured you. Typically, you became an Evid because you couldn't pay your debts and you would commit to work for six years to pay off your debts. Uh, so that's how you became an Evid, a, a, a Hebrew uh, bondsman, as it were. And then you pay off your debt and you say to yourself, this is, this is actually where I, this is where I want to live and I want to die. So I look, began to look at myself and I think to myself, how dare I be so judgmental of this person? I don't know their life story. And, and, and in a way, I use this to break open the ice over my sea of how, how unempathetic it was me for to read the story and sit in such superiority and judgment over this tragic story of a person who says, I'd rather live here than go out into a world, perhaps, that drove the person into destitution, that ran the person broke, that bankrupted the person. So the person says, I don't want to go out there again. What do I know? Uh, one last thing as I'm looking over the Parsha about law is poetry. Uh, there's a law in our Parsha that says, don't leave an uncovered pit. Now, why do people dig pits? Uh, you know, maybe they had a Geiger counter at the beach and looking for watches. I don't know, or probably not, but maybe they're looking for precious metals or something and says, you dig a pit, cover the pit because someone might fall into your pit. So it's called the law of the pit. Uh, don't create create a hazard. So I wanted to try this Hasidic practice. And I was saying to myself, um, don't leave an uncovered pit. Okay. Don't leave an uncovered pit. Really, don't leave an uncovered pit. What's the worst uncovered pit? Well, to tell you the truth, it's I. I'm the worst uncovered pit. My distraught feelings and emotions can be a pit for someone else. They just fall into it. Maybe you're the uncovered pit. Maybe you're creating a hazard. Not the hazard of someone falling into another pit, but maybe, maybe sometimes you become hazardous. The person says, wow, I think I just fallen into an uncovered pit. With yeah, you're, you're going a little bit crazy on me here. I've seen it right in front of me. And I've seen people become to other people uncovered pits. And I started meditating on that and saying to myself, don't become an uncovered pit. Don't become a hazard for other people, especially the people that we love. Don't walk around in a state of mind, in a state of being, where people have to really watch out for you and wish you would have put a danger sign in front of you. 
So this is for me the poetry of law. Part of the poetry of law for me is taking each little pasuk from the Parsha, meditating on it, and empathetically going into the inner life of the pasuk, and maybe even disrupting what you thought about it before, and maybe turning the pasuk back onto yourself. So to experience law as poetry requires us, first of all, what, what is a common denominator of poetry, if I understand poetry at all? It's opaque. The difference between prose and poetry is prose tries to make itself clear, and at some level, poetry wants to be opaque, which means you got to really pay attention. Um, like, there are poems you can cruise through, and by the way, I, I like poems that don't feel like I'm breaking the frozen sea with an axe. Sometimes I like poems that take me surfing at the beach. I, I'm, I'm going to admit, sometimes I like poems that just make me happy, and sun, and catching the wave. I like those poems. But I also like the poems that that break me apart and 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 find the tragedy within. They're, they're, they're all poetry to me. And so when we come at law and you say, oh my God, this is boring. Okay, so now I'm going to speak for the law. Law says, well, maybe you're boring. Maybe you don't know how to read law. Maybe you don't know that every legal case is boring until it's your case, until you go to court, until you find yourself in court. And that's the law. And you say to yourself, I hope the judge is just. I hope I can make my case. I hope I'm right. So one of the beautiful things about the Talmud, by the way, when you study Talmud law, sometimes they, you've heard me teach this before, they, they have a, they, they, they dig out a law so carefully, they finally get the pristine version of it. And then there's an anecdote at the end of the discussion that reverses everything that the rabbis have done. And so first of all, I think to myself, who are these geniuses who spend page after page perfecting a law and then make sure to add and end with an anecdote that undoes all the work that they just did. Now, that is poetry of law and the unusual poetry of Talmud that takes you down a path and reverses the path all of a sudden and then becomes opaque. You figure it out. Here's the law, and here's the case, and they're oppositional to each other, and now we're going to be quiet. This is one of my favorite things about studying Talmud is the constant reversals. And th there have been years when I've actually taught a... a, a piece of Talmud, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do that on some of our uh, Shabbos mornings. So what I want to uh, recommend to you, and this is with the idea of law as poetry, Rav Cook said, just as there are laws of poetry, there's poetry of law. What does that mean? The law's opaque. The law's not boring. Maybe you're boring because you don't know how to read a poem. And the law says, okay, now that I have your attention, I put you down a little bit. You say, well, I don't want to be boring. I want to look at the law. I says, okay, so I want you to see inside. I want you to go into the deep cavern that these laws were about people. These laws are about people who were stranded in some kind of litigation. And, and, and over time, the, the culture figures it out. And they say, okay, we're going to lay this down. So we won't get stranded in the same place over and over again. So when you read a law that says, um, don't leave an uncovered pit, can you go back to the case? Can you think about the person who fell into an uncovered pit and got hurt and crawled out and go back to the town and said, somebody left an uncovered pit? They say, well, it's not on his property and he didn't do it on purpose. Is that really against the law? They say, yeah, actually, we think we should have a law about uncovered pits. And you can imagine the town elder sitting and saying, how much are we responsible? You go a mile out into the desert and you dig a pit. Shouldn't other people just be aware of where they walk? Shouldn't people like have their eyes open? Someone says, yeah, actually, not so much. If you're going to be digging pits, you know, put a warning sign up, fill up, fill up your pit. I can just imagine, you know, the elders saying, well, how far are we going to go? Tell people what to do out in the desert. I mean, uh, is there any limit to how much we can boss people around? And maybe someone says, actually, kind of not. We actually have to tell people. They got to be careful with the lives of other people. And yeah, it's your pit, but, but it's their life. So try to imagine that every single law you read there are human beings whose lives are at stake. There's an ethical consideration, fairness, human decency. It gets congealed into a law, and then our eyes roll. So I want to invite you to look at every law as a case of human fairness and human suffering and society trying to figure it out and writing down a law. So there's the, the record of the humanity of the law, and then there's the poetic appropriation of the law. So I want to give you those two insights. So what do we mean by law is poetry? There's an opaque case there of human beings. 
And there's also an opaque uh, uh, spiritual dimension as well. 